we represent books that we really do love and believe in, and we work our butts off for them. Welcome to Business School for Writers, where we help storytellers like you ditch the starving artist cliche and thrive. I'm your host, Lauren Marie Fleming, and I am obsessed with the power of stories. I've seen the way stories heal writers, readers, and whole communities. But I've also seen the way we silence marginalized voices and discourage people from pursuing a career as a writer, which is why I'm here today helping you to ditch the lies you've been told about whose story matters and instead embrace the truth that the world needs your story now more than ever. I am living proof that it is possible to build a thriving career as a writer. And I created Business School for Writers to show you exactly how you can write more, publish more, and make more money as a storyteller. Welcome to your virtual classroom. Welcome to your cheerleading squad. Welcome to Business School for Writers. Do you long to hold your book in your hands, to see a physical manifestation of your story out into the world? I know that feeling and it is amazing. The problem is, Getting published can be a long, hard road, and self-publishing can feel overwhelming, expensive, and complicated. But it doesn't have to be that way. I spent years of my life, years, Googling, going to writers' conferences, and reading all the books, trying to figure out what that whole publishing thing was about. I interviewed experts, I gathered experiences, and I put all of that together in a program for you. Why? Because I don't want you to waste decades of your life waiting to publish your book. I want to read your story now. So I created a program just for you and it's called Path to Published. And it's a step-by-step -step roadmap to help you get your story out into the world. Whether you're self-publishing, traditionally publishing, or working with a hybrid option, Path to Published is your guide along the publishing journey, supporting you every step of the way. Want a sneak peek at the program? Go to businessschoolforwriters.com slash publishing for some free instructional videos. That's businessschoolforwriters.com slash publishing. As always, that link is in the show notes for you. Head on over there and check it out because the world needs your story now more than ever. And I cannot wait to read your book. Hello, Elise. I am so excited to have you on. You are a dear friend of mine, and normally we do these things in person, but COVID has us far apart. But at least I get to see your face today and hear your voice. So hello and welcome. Why don't you tell the listeners who aren't a big fan of you already or yet um, who you are and um, what you do in this world? Well, first of all, Lauren, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. I'm also sorry that we can't be doing this in person and drinking some cocktails while we talk, but next time. Next time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, and, I, and I'm also so excited for the launch of your podcast and everything you're doing. Thank but we'll, you. We'll talk about all of that. So for listeners who do not know me, my name is Elise Capron. I'm from the Dykstra Agency. We are based in San Diego, California, and we're an agency that has been around for 40 years doing a really wide range of all kinds of stuff for a generalist agency. And so there is someone at our agency for just about every type of writer, which is exciting. But for myself, I mostly work with fiction writers for the adult market, um, mostly literary fiction, like pretty far, far leaning over in the literary side. And then on the nonfiction front, I work with a lot of journalists and historians. And I've been at the Dykstra Agency for 16 years and just love what I do. I truly love working with writers and help them find their best publishing path, being an advocate for them and really being their teammate on the publishing journey. I love that. I love that. And I have read lots of the books that you've put out and I love them. And I also have read a lot of the books that, you, that you've suggested from your peers and love them as well. So I just get really excited that there's an agency here in San Diego. I think that we think of literary agents as only in New York City and kind of at least to me in San Diego, as far away in the country as possible. So it's really nice to have an agency right here in town. And do you think that not being in New York 
allows you to be a little bit more boutique or, or what, how does that change for you as an agency, not being right in the heart of New York? Well, I mean, it's certainly different not being in New York. I do not go out for happy hours and last minute lunch lunches with editors. And so that does change my experience for sure. And any West Coast agent would say that certainly. But I do think that actually being a non-New York agent can have its advantages too. In fact, on our website, um, the dykstraagency.com, my boss actually wrote a piece years ago, Sandy Dykstra, and it's on our website and it's called Being Out There. And it's actually about being a West Coast agent. And I should say that she wrote this piece, you know, many years ago when there were hardly any West Coast agents at all. Now there's a lot of us, but it's still a terrific piece to look at because she really does hone in on what it's like to be out there. And the way her piece kind of encapsulates it and the way I think about it too is that we are really focused on the authors and the work all the time. And so our day to day is, yes, we're still on email all the time and phone all the time, just like everybody else. But we really do, I think, get to focus on our authors and the manuscripts and don't have some of those distractions of being in the city. And I will say too, I mean, in 40 years, it has never hurt our success as an agency as a whole. And uh, and actually the little bit of backstory that may be interesting to some listeners about my boss is that she actually is a New Yorker, but moved to California in the late 60s and started the agency from scratch on the West Coast when there really were very, very few people doing any sort of book publishing outside of New York. Um, I always have tremendous respect for her because she did this at a time before email. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not know how she did it. And she did it really from the ground up. She did not work at some other, you know, agency and build her way up. I mean, she started it from scratch. And I will always, always just be amazed that she did that. So my whole experience of being an agent is really built on her experience of having done that. I also like to think of us a little bit as kind of a traditional like New York agency you know, given where she's coming from, but near the beach in San Diego. So it all, to me, it's like a perfect balance. It all works out. I love it. And like I said, it really doesn't hurt us. And I should add too, for other, you know, West Coast based writers who are listening is they, these days there are actually a lot of agents in San Diego in particular. Uh, we have a great community here and a lot of romance agents and commercial women's writers agents and children's agents all right in San Diego. So that's pretty exciting. I didn't know that. I thought that you were the only agency in San Diego. That makes me happy. Everybody moved to San Diego. We have a big writing <laughs> culture here. It's actually one of the reasons I moved back here is I found that it had a more accessible writing culture. Portland I was living in and it's known for its writing culture, but it felt so inundated and it felt so hard to access and to like get a step foot in. Whereas I felt like here, the community of writers is so strong and so supportive and so friendly in a way that I hadn't felt met anywhere else. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I love that. And we're doing more and more. I mean, San Diego, I think has really, we have really upped our game as a city just in the last few years. Also, starting major literary events like we have the San Diego Festival of Books now which is going to be happening virtually very soon and uh, the San Diego Writers Festival just happened so there is just this amazing um, I think kind of evolution going on at the moment within Southern California to really you know build stronger community for writers and authors and book lovers and I think that's fantastic and really exciting. I love that. We also have a really strong romance writers of America group as well. So it's a great place. And but you don't have to be in San Diego to pitch to you guys, right? Correct. I, yes, I feel we... like this is a pitch to move to San Diego, but we're here to talk <laughs> about agent work. <laughs> yes. And, and I should say for all the emphasis I'm putting on San Diego is that agents these days, yes, a lot of them are still in New York and that's great and fine, but agents are based everywhere these days. You do not have to be in New York or San Diego or anywhere. You can be, you know, living in Alaska or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, and, and that it helps because, of course, we are in these days can be an email based industry, um, which makes it pretty easy. But uh, this is to say that, you know, if you 
if you reach out to an agent who's living in some small town somewhere, <laughs> that's okay. Not to discount them. I think successful agents can be based anywhere. I love that, especially someone who's nomadic. So I like it'd be really difficult for me to pick an agent one location. Exactly. So I'm just going to dig right into something that I've talked to with you a little bit about, but I keep seeing on the internet in these forum groups I'm in, and that is what is the point of a literary agent? Why get a literary agent? I hear people saying I might as well just self-publish or why would I give this person my 15%? Like what even does an agent do for me? I think that people have gotten kind of a little bit jaded around agents. And since I'm a huge fan of what agents do and what agents can do and how they can help you, I can speak a little bit on that. But I thought that maybe you would could speak a little bit on the role of an agent and what, how an agent can help you both with your singular book and with your overall writing career. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, do you absolutely have to have an agent no matter what? No, of course. And Lauren, I know through everything you do, you talk a lot about all the different paths there can be to publishing, which I'm a huge advocate of this as well, is finding your right path. And for and if going with a smaller press or with or self-publishing is the best path for you, you don't need an agent. You don't. And that's great and that's fine. And you can be a very successful author that way. However, the bottom line is that if your priority as a writer is to go the quote unquote traditional or commercial publishing path that you want to be published by a house like Random House or Simon and Schuster or Norton or whomever, then the reality is that you will have to have an agent by your side to do that. Most big publishers will not even accept a submission from an unagented writer. So there is just that bottom line reality. However, I can say that and that doesn't mean anything and make the person who doesn't like agents make us <laughs> make them like us. But what I can tell you is that agents do so much more than just sell your book and take that 15% and walk away. So what an agent really is, when you have a good partnership that's working, is that we are your career managers and we are your advocates through not just the publication of one book, but through your entire, hopefully, your entire publishing career. So if just a few things that we that we do, and maybe we can talk about some of these more in detail, but to give you kind of the bullet point list, uh, first of all, we work developmentally with writers a lot, sometimes quite in depth. Um, when you're first getting an agent, that is not necessarily going to be the case because, I mean, you will do some work, but you need to bring a pretty polished, clean project to an agent. Of course, you don't want to bring your first draft and expect them to work on it <laughs> with you from the beginning. But as I have clients who I work with for years together, we really develop projects from the ground up together over time. So that becomes an important part of our relationship. Of course, we sell the book to the publisher. That's another key role and the one we're kind of known for, right? But not just any publisher. An agent's job is to really, if she can, find the very, very best publisher for your particular career, your particular book, the place where your book will actually thrive and be well supported. And your agent is the one who can really make sure that that happens, that you're going to the right publishers, the right editors, the type of houses who can get your book reviewed, all of that, just to set you up for success from the beginning by placing you at the right house. We also negotiate your publishing contracts and all kinds of other uh, contracts that come up, which comes into kind of our management capacity too. If you sell, you know, a personal essay somewhere, you want your agent to look over that. So we do all those contract reviews for you and negotiations. There's also a lot of other elements that an agent can be involved in, such as subrights. And what are subrights? Um, subrights are things like film rights audio rights, uh, foreign rights, stuffed animal rights. If your agent has negotiated to handle those rights for you when they sell your book, then they will be involved in licensing all of those rights for you and really helping your book get out into every possible format everywhere around the world. 
Can we just pause for a second? You yeah. just said stuffed animal, right? <laughs> okay. we, we do that. <laughs> what is that? Like, what does that look like? Stuffed animal rights? I want to sell the stuffed animal rights to one of my books. So that is mostly for our children's authors. Oh, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> for example, uh, we represent Janelle Cannon, who wrote Stella Luna and many other wonderful books. And so she's done quite a few stuffed animals for all of her books. Um, but we've had others too. So no, we have definitely done stuffed animals. Oh I want to sell the stuffed animal rights to my romances and have it be like a big, <laughs> you know, those pillows that hug you like you're the boyfriend? Yes. Yeah, that's what I want. I want stuffed animal rights, but it's like, a human-sized pillow. I'm you there. Should do I'm it. gonna make it I happen. Think <laughs> I think it's fantastic. Okay. I just had I couldn't that let is that one creative go. branding. I like right? that. <laughs> just couldn't let that one go by without bringing up the whole stuffed animal rights. Keep that going. Is, Keep telling us great. this amazing <laughs> list of things. But because I think even some of these, like stuffed animal rights, I didn't realize that agents do all of this. That I mean, I know i you've been my friend for almost a decade and I, did, I don't think I really quite understood the full capacity of the agent relationship. So keep going. I love this. This is great. Yeah. So a few other things. So we also advise and oversee the entire publishing process, which is a complex process and a long process. Publishing, if I can say one thing about like the publishing industry is it's not fast. You know, the process of publishing a book, well, first of all, like doing a contract and then you going off and finishing or revising that book and then actually publishing it, it can be a span of several years. And your agent is the one who's in there really making sure that all balls are moving forward, that there are no hiccups, that you're not getting lost in a sea of other books, all that kind of stuff, that there are no problems along the way. On the topic of problems, agents are mediators when those problems do come up. We are the person between you and the publisher. Sometimes there are arguments. Things do not always go perfectly. And your agent is the one who is trying to find the happy medium and keep balls rolling. That's kind of what I think of my job as a lot of the time is like just the person who keeps everything moving forward as much as possible. We also just simply make sure you're taken care of by your publisher. Again, don't let you get lost, like I said, in the ocean of other books that are being published. We are handling things like your jacket art, making sure that we see that in advance and that we're arguing about it if we don't like it. Does that mean that an agent can magically get you the exact jacket you want? Um, this is a question that comes up a lot. If you're not totally happy with it, not always. I mean, we can't force a publisher to just change their whole strategy with how they're going to publish your book and present it to the world. But we do at least have that chance to really have that conversation. And again, try to find the happy medium. And we also just really try to help shape our clients' careers over time. My ideal scenario is that I work with my authors for many years and over the course of many books. And it's really exciting and fun because we honestly do grow together and over time and evolve together and help like learn about each other and shape each other's ideas. And that can be just so rewarding when I'm like four or five books in with one of my clients and to kind of see the journey that we've, you know, we've covered. And yeah, so that's kind of what an agent does. I would say maybe like two things that an agent does not do, um, which I think there's a lot of confusion about. Agents are not publicists, which maybe is one area where some writers may think like, oh, agents don't do anything, you know, because an agent or if a writer asks their agent, like, can you please pitch me to these places? That's not your agent's job. They have a million other things to do. And the reason is, is that being a publicist is it's a whole full-time job on it in itself. Like you don't want, frankly, I don't think you want your agent trying to juggle like publicity and managing your career. It's too much. So do understand um, that, yeah, agents are not publicists. You have a publicist that you either hire or that is also just within your publishing house already. And they're the person who can do that job best. And we do not serve as editors, even though most agents do do a lot of editorial and developmental work. So don't lean on your agent to be your only editor through the process. Um, we'll be involved, but you should have your own beta readers and critique groups and all that good stuff as, as well. 
And I would say every agent probably has kind of a different level of editorial work they will do with their clients, just depending on kind of what kind of person they are and how, you know, how they, they work on that side of things. But yeah, I think that kind of sums up the what we do and what we do not do, <laughs> if that's helpful. I think that's so helpful because I think that when I hear people complaining about traditional publishing and agents, they're almost always complaining about the marketing. Like it's almost always the end that their book didn't sell enough. So I love that you set that, I want to call it a boundary, but I don't think it's a boundary, that job description that you're not a publicist, you're a manager and the marketing and the publicity needs to go to somebody else. And I think that that's okay because you just listed a dozen things that you do do and you can't be everything, right? Like you're an amazing manager. So that publicity is a different skill set. Like I want someone who's a master at what they do. So I love that agents are a master at managing the publishing career of their writers, but they're not the masters of publicity. Go to a publicist for that. And also when you were talking about how you love fostering that relationship over years, I had the honor of being invited to at the um, San Diego Union Tribune's Festival of Books. Afterwards, your agency had a lunch, a happy hour with your agents and your clients. And it was it was really beautiful to see the friendships that all of you had and the way in which your your writers were friends. And it was, I just keep thinking of your YA and I'm not going to call them out, but you had a YA writer and a YA agent and they were geeking out together over the latest YA books that were out in the genre that she wrote in. And it was just really cute to watch. And like you and one of your writers were so excited to see each other. And it just reminded me that that depending on how you set up the relationship, obviously you're not going to be best friends with everybody, but there is that bond that happens, especially over years, that was really beautiful to see. And I want to point out that not all agents are like that, you know, but also like you have good lawyers, you have bad lawyers, you have good managers, you have bad managers, you have good bosses, you have bad bosses, you have good friends, you have bad friends. Like it's not everybody, but there is this beautiful old, like working together towards a similar goal that happens that I love seeing. I, I totally agree. And and yes, thank you for mentioning that wonderful uh, gathering we had last year. It was great. But yeah, and that kind of gets down to, I suppose, uh, the core of what, you know, an agent does. And it's that we represent books that we really do love and believe in, and we work our butts off for them. Again, this kind of question of what an agent does, we work really, really, really hard. And we're not, you know, Yes, we make that 15%, but we're not being paid anything for, you know, to, <laughs> directly for anything we do, right? So we we have to work for that money that we earn. We have to work for that commission. And and with no real promises. I mean, if we if we go on sale with a book and put countless hours into trying to sell it and it's an unfortunate situation where it doesn't sell, which is always super super sad, but does happen once in a while, you know, we don't make any money at that point. So <laughs> just going, going directly to this question of like commission. Um, so we really, number one, have to believe in the work we do. And then it's so rewarding when we actually can get to that finish line and help build a successful career. It means the world to us. And and even more so when we can do that over the course of several books. I also, I have mad respect. I've had two agents so far and both of them worked their butts off for me and my books didn't sell it just wasn't the right like i didn't have a big enough following for the nonfiction. the fiction was a little off like i've had two agents and it just they worked their butts off for me and they got nothing in return money wise i mean they got to read my lovely book i could be i could be egotistic and say that but in reality they also read 200 lovely books that week as well you know they got <laughs> right. nothing monetarily out of it but they put all of their energy into it so i'm always so grateful for the agents that i have had and i've gone the traditional publishing route and i've gone the self publishing route and if you're interested in those my path to publish course will help you figure out which one to take and I have like a whole quiz you can figure out on businessschoolforwriters.com. I'll include that link to the quiz in here to figure out which route to take. So I think it's about choosing the right route. And we talk a lot about should I take traditional publishing or should I take self-publishing? But I also think that we should talk about how you pick the right agent. Like I, 
I think that we want a big name publisher, we want a big name agent, but that's not the right path for all of us. So how does an agent choose? First off, let's start even farther back than that. How do you find an agent? Like what, where do you even begin? Yeah, so there are a few really great ways to start the process of researching the right agent for you. And just as you said, I mean, it is about finding the right person for your particular the type of books you write, the career you're building, the type of person you are. Um, if you have a bad partnership, it's just like not the right fit. It's probably not going to work very well. And it's always a risk. I mean, you don't know which agent's going to, you know, get you the <laughs> big deal you want and which one is not. Sometimes, you know, good agents fail too. Like, but if you can at least start the process off right by targeting agents who are really a good fit for you, you know, you're going to hopefully get to a productive and happy relationship a lot faster. So a few ways that you can start to kind of name hunt for agents, which I should say too, is a, is a tough process. Like there are a million agents. We don't have to have any particular credentials. Like, who the heck are we? Where are we? There's a bunch of us on Twitter. Like, <laughs> you know, how, how do you wade through that? So yeah, a, f a, few, a few ways. First of all, there's the really awesome, like old school way that I still love and still very much support. And that is looking at books you would consider uh, comparable to your own work. In every, in all, not every, in almost every published book, there is a magical page called the Acknowledgements. This page, <laughs> and I say this with some grandeur because I truly mean it, this page is a treasure trove of information about that book you're reading. If you love a book, please, please, please do yourself a favor and always read the Acknowledgements page. That page, and even if you're just pleasure reading, that page will, in most cases, mention who the whole publishing team was. Also, you know, the author's inspirations. I mean, it has all kinds of cool stuff. But from your standpoint as someone looking for an, for an agent, that agent will most likely be thanked on the acknowledgements page. So that's a fantastic way to just initially kind of baby step towards the process of finding some agent names who might be a good fit for your type of work. Some a few other ways, and also kind of then double checking things, uh, referrals and uh, recommendations from your writer friends who have been through the process. Not something to be discounted. Really important. Going to events, and if you do see an agent speak and they seem to do what you do, that's a great way to start. And uh, and then there there are plenty of online resources as well, but. I, there's only one website I really trust in terms of reliable information, which I will talk about in one moment. Also, just fishing around on, uh, in terms of kind of starter steps, uh, fishing around on Twitter. So many agents are on Twitter, and at least you can start kind of, kind of following people and like just again, kind of name gathering, figuring out who they are, getting a sense of their personality. That'll start to lead you in the right direction. Once you've done these kind of initial steps and you kind of have a pool of potential names, the website that I mentioned a moment ago, is that's the one truly reliable source, I believe, for, you know, correct information on what people are doing and looking for and a great, great place to research agents for your work is a website called Publishers Marketplace. It is really the only website I will 100% recommend for this kind of information. So Publishers Marketplace has two very, very valuable things about it. The first thing, which I, I think you should all go just put this, put this podcast on pause and go do right now, is go sign up for the Publishers Lunch email newsletter. It's a free email newsletter that is a really awesome like one to three page email that every single person around the world in publishing gets and comes just comes right into your inbox every day and you can read about what's going on in the publishing world that day who won which big award that week all that sort of stuff um you can start getting savvy on this business and industry that you want to be a part of which so taps into everything you talk about Lauren in terms of approaching this truly as a business it's so important but in terms of the question at hand the publisher, so Publishers Lunch is part of Publishers Marketplace. So PublishersMarketplace.com, um, this does cost a little bit of money, but it's very reasonable and you can just subscribe to it for two or three months, say, while you're doing your research. 
Publishers Marketplace carries an archive of every reported publishing deal going back to, I believe, 1996. So this is a place where you can actually look at real reported, done contracted publishing deals. And you can search this archive by genre, by keyword, by agent name, by publisher, by whatever the heck you want. And right there, you will see a list of every person involved in that deal, the editor who bought it the, at, at the publishing house they were based at, and the agent who, who sold it. So you can really quickly see a list of agents who are doing the genre you're working in or working, you know, even within like a certain topic um, of, you know, a certain area of memoir, for example. So that is a wonderful, wonderful way to really start gathering those names. Once you do have those names, of course, you want to do that extra layer of research on each person, make sure that they're still acquiring in that particular area you know, that they're still taking on projects at all, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. You don't just want to jump on um, something you saw from a reported deal from three years ago, but it's a great, great way to start kind of getting those names and figuring out who your good, your possible publishing matches might be. And I actually have a free download. We'll include it in the show notes. That's a spreadsheet to help you keep track of all of who you pitched and what. That was one of the hardest things for me was like figuring out how to keep track of it. So I have this free spreadsheet and I'll include that in the show notes for you all. So you can download that too. I love that you that brought- That is amazing that you all that. Oh my God, <laughs> That's it, great. It made a huge, the first time I did it, I just kind of like had an email back and forth to a writing coach I had and I ended up pitching someone twice and it was really embarrassing. Um, getting a rejection twice, a rejection for your second time saying, hey, I already rejected you. That was fun. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I love that you brought up Publishers Marketplace. I didn't know about the archive of the publishing deals. That's great to know about. I also, though, suggested there is a free section where you can just see agents who are taking new clients. You can't there see you if they have are doing deals or what they're doing. And it can kind of actually be wading through a marsh. So I love that idea of looking at the archives and seeing what they might have sold before and if it works in the same genre or the same style as yours but there is a free option to search there. And that's a great place to start looking for agents. And I also love that you brought up Twitter because while Twitter's not just the place for you know trolls that everybody sees, it is, there are some really great conversations being had with agents um, on Twitter. So if you want to see what agents are selling or buying or they're looking for, they'll sometimes tweet it. So if you find someone on Publishers Marketplace, you can go to their website or to their Twitter and find out what they're trying, what they're looking for currently. Absolutely. Just to say, I guess one more thing on Twitter is it really is such a valuable tool. I myself am not as active on Twitter as I would say a lot of agents. Some agents are on Twitter every day. And it's just like a real part of finding clients and talking about their work. So um, there are a lot of agents out there who, yeah, following them on Twitter will be a very productive activity. And on Twitter as well, there are also tons of like contests these days, like Pit Mad, um, where you can actually go and live pitch your uh, book concept and, and agents are watching and will request projects during that specified time. My colleague, my wonderful colleague, Tao Lee, who's like a rock star in kids and YA, uh, she has found many clients from those pit mad contests. Yeah, I love that. I actually know a New York Times bestselling author who was found through, uh, through Twitter, through pit mad. And now PitMad will have coaches and mentorship. I mean, there's so much great stuff that's happening there. So I think first and foremost, though, understanding the relation, like understanding the business, like you were talking about, getting to know what to expect from your agent, what the agent expects from you. That's what these conversations are about first and foremost. So I follow a ton of agents. None of them are my agent. None of them I would even pitch. I love, like I started talking to you. Well, first off, we saw each other at a conference and liked each other's hair and, and ordered the same drink at a bar. So we knew we were going to be good friends. But beyond that, I just love talking to you about publishing. You would never publish my book because I would never write a historical <laughs> book or I don't write literary. I write a lot more pop culture-y and um, I write a lot more like contemporary women's literature. And But that doesn't mean that 
following you on social media, it doesn't give me lots of satisfaction. First off, your dogs are adorable. And second, it teaches me a lot about the publishing industry, which I want to be a part of. So I highly suggest to a lot of people, just like Elise said, to really immerse yourself in this like you would any other career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is it is about immersing yourself. I love putting it that way. And about becoming part of the conversation and the community. And publishing is, in a lot of ways, kind of a small community. You know, so, I mean, everybody kind of knows each other a little bit more or less you know so you standing out there it's like it's like being at a party standing off in the corner is not necessarily going to help you you might you might get pulled in if someone really notices you your you know gleaming gleaming beautiful talent way over there in the dark corner but it's much easier if you come into the conversation and you're part of the community and you support those around you as well that's also really important and you engage, it will really make a difference. And also we are looking kind of like you talked about, you know, just having like just real conversations and stuff and just actually getting to know each other as people that really helps too, because that leads to understanding how we, you know, relate to each other and connect with each other. And for the agent, the, the writers I take on, you know, I want us to click, like we have to have the same vision and priorities and understand each other. We don't have to be exactly the same. I don't have to be BFFs with all my clients and I'm I'm not. It is a business relationship. But but I do think it's important that we are able to engage organically and uh, genuinely with each other uh, on a lot of levels. That has to be there. And um yeah, so what you're saying is just kind of jumping in and just being part of it. It, it really does help and can get you to that the next level. And then also understanding when you do do that jumping in Understanding who you are as a writer and what you bring to the table and understanding that that to your core, you know, really being comfortable with that, I think is important. And that's about, that is about brand a little bit and about all these things. But yeah, it's, and I don't, I don't mean for that to be a daunting thing, but it is something you should be comfortable with. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's like owning the genre you're excited about writing. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And whatever that is. I mean, I think for sometimes we look down on certain genres and look up on others, or sometimes we see others as unattainable and others as not just whatever you're writing, love it. And if you love it and you talk about it with other people who love it, you're going to find the right agent at the right house for you. Absolutely. So a big question that I have. So I asked my writer squad um, what they wanted to do. And if anybody wants to join the writer squad, it's free at facebook.com slash groups slash writer squad. And I think Elise is actually in there too. If you, if they had any questions for you, and I had a few, so I thought that we could maybe go to Q&A. What do you think? Let's do it. How the big one, and this is actually coming from me, but also from, I had a couple other people ask this too. How has... COVID affected publishing? Should people hold off on trying to find agents right now or agents taking submissions? Well, great question. And certainly something that has been on everybody's mind, I think, um, the last few months. So publishing has, has carried on. I'll put it that way. The thing is that, yes, this has been hard on everyone, but the bottom line is that publishers have to buy books to make money. They have to acquire new books so that one year or two years or five years from now, they have new books to publish so that readers will buy those books and they can continue to support their company. So they have, that's that's central to their existence, right? So they, they got to do that. And then I have to sell books <laughs> to make a living too. So we have, we find a way, the process continues for sure. We, the Dykstra Agency, we are actually doing a lot of sales. We're actually having a great year. Amazing. Congrats. Yeah. No, it's, it is wonderful. And, you know, we're all, we're not distracted by like happy hours and stuff. Like we're all stuck at home <laughs> by ourselves, unable to socialize. So we're really focused on reading manuscripts and everything. But I will say there is a difference um, since COVID started. And I think it kind of comes down to this. So. Obviously, everyone, all these editors, if I kind of put it in the publisher's side of things, they're all working from home. They're all probably, you know, a lot of them are 
you know, having to juggle a partner also at home or having to teach kids while also working, you know, all these things that we're having to do in these like crazy, crazy year we're having. And so I think everybody is a little frazzled. And I think a lot of people may be a little bit burned out or brain dead. (laughs) And that does play a part, I think, in what's happening in publishing right now a little bit. So basically, since COVID started, I have I my feel my personal feeling and my personal experience has been that publishers are definitely buying, but they really want the projects that are absolute sure things. And that is kind of the tough, that's the tough truth. And I realize that's a little bit hard to hear as maybe just a brand new debut writer, but that is kind of where we are at this moment. I think hopefully we're kind of getting out of that a little bit. Uh, at this point, because, you know, I think at this stage, we're all kind of just grasping what where we are and what this means. We're not in total shock, shell shock mode. But so when COVID started, like one, th- one thing that was interesting that we were seeing with book trends was that book buyers were going, they were still buying a ton of books, but they were really going back to like the tried and true bestsellers that maybe they hadn't read when they first come out, like Hunger Games. Yeah, they were going back to these these books that, you know, again, are are the sure things, are the things they know they're going to enjoy that are on the more commercial side. And, and that, I think, has also now kind of been reflected in what publishers are buying is, number one, publishers can't afford to have a lot of failure, right? And so they have to really buy the stuff that they know is going to sell. And I think, frankly, they're also buying the stuff that like, you know, is super like commercial, like kind of in your face concepts that are, you know, again, kind of going back to their their sure things, people are going to buy them. So I, I do think that since COVID started, the books that maybe are having a bit of a tougher time are the you know, maybe the quote unquote, I hate using this word, but the quote unquote quiet books, I think those are a really tough sell from an agent to a publisher right now. When you say quiet books, what is the, what is that a term for? The stuff that the, the, maybe the books that don't have the big, like high concept going on, probably frankly, kind of the more slightly more literary novels (laughs) that I would do. Yeah. So So, but again, you know, I I think we're now several months into this and I do think that things are changing, but this is kind of what I have seen happening, uh, happen since COVID started. So the past five months, all of our sales as an agency have either sold for like a lot of money, like really, really big sales or just fallen completely flat on their face. So that is to say that right now, or at least for the last five months, I don't feel like there's been much of a middle ground. It's kind of all or nothing. Now, does that mean that you should not be going to agents? Certainly not. I mean, I mean you, that you, sh- <laughs> you certainly should not halt your submission process. I do think you should still be getting your work out there 100%. And that is because, because you still need to find, I mean, whatever kind of work you're doing, you still need to find that right teammate for you. Even if I'm not going to be going on sale with your project like next week, I still am looking for the kind of projects that I love and that I'm probably also going to need to do editorial work with you. And so very likely in most cases, someone I'm signing right now, I might go on sale with three months from now, or sometimes if it needs more work, maybe six months from now. So I'm not just thinking at this exact moment you know, I'm looking kind of at that long game. So I definitely don't, I wouldn't put it on hold at all, but I would, I would be using this time to do everything you possibly can to increase your platform, your business savvy about publishing, you know, your connections, getting your work out there, submitting either short stories or essays or op-eds or whatever you can to really build that writerly platform because the I do think it is a tougher market right now. And so I do think agents need to see that you can bring a lot to the table. The more you can bring, the more appealing you're going to be. And so use this time, especially now we're all stuck in our houses, 
you know, to focus on that part of your developing your writerly career and hearing everything Lauren has to say about this side of it, about your business plan as a writer becomes absolutely crucial. And this is the perfect moment to be focusing on this stuff. Well, thank you. I appreciate that you appreciate what I'm doing. I mean, my biggest goal is to teach that business side because I think there are so many stories, especially marginalized voices stories that don't get out there that I don't get to read selfishly. I'm selfish. I want to read them. Uh, I don't get to read and we don't get to read and that don't are out there helping and healing our community because people are scared of the logistical side. So that's why my goal is to kind of take the take the lack of knowledge, the lack of access to knowledge and the fear out of the logistical side so people can be more creative and we can get more different voices out there and more voices out there. And so I appreciate that you help me with <laughs> figuring out that logistical side and come on here and share your aspect because I wouldn't know anything of this without your help. So thank you. Just briefly, because I know this is an important topic to you. Is I do just I do want to say that publishing has been is an industry that has been slow to change, too far too slow to change. However, this year, you know, definitely, but also the last couple years, I do think that publishing has been going through a reckoning. And I do think that the industry has been waking up. And I think that things are changing and agents and editors at publishing houses are trying to make a difference and make more, really truly make more room for a wider range of voices. And that's incredibly important to me. It's incredibly important to my agency as a whole. And I think it's a great time uh, for change within the publishing world. So I'm very, very optimistic about uh, this particular side of things. That's really great to hear. And I actually have seen that with my friends and with myself as well. And when I first pitched to publishers a decade ago, they said my stuff was too gay. And when I pitched to people a year ago, they said my stuff wasn't gay enough. So I think that that is at least for me a sign that things are changing at least and there's more open-mindedness or more at least commercial desire. I mean, it's a business. I tell people this is a business. There has to be a commercial want. So if you haven't yet, go back and listen to my episode where I talk about if you want to see books like yours on the shelf, you need to read books like yours and buy books like yours. If you haven't listened to that yet, go back because I'm a big proponent of reading and buying the books you like because this is a business. So that they see that that sells, they're going to buy more like it. Absolutely. I think that's such a good and important point. I just listened to that episode, which is fantastic. And absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we have to, we can't just put our content out in the world. We have to support other content creators as well. We have to be a community. We have to stick together. That's how we make good change. And that's how we see, like you said, the voices and, you know, the perspectives that we want in the world. Okay. We're getting towards the end of our time. So let's get, let's do round robin, like really fast uh, answering these questions. So what makes you read a book? What's in a good cover letter? Like what, how does a book stand out to you? So when I get when I'm getting a book as a submission, I mean a, a, just a couple of very quick things: a query letter um, or a submission that is clear and concise and understands what it is is a really good way to get my attention. Just simply giving me the tools to understand what you're doing with your in your project. So many query letters are not clear enough. And as far as me personally, also making a personal connection, letting, like, showing me that, you know, you really think we're a good match, that also helps. But yeah, as far as what really makes me feel connected or find a project appealing, you know, genuinely, I'm looking for stories I haven't heard before. Like, really, if I, especially, um, I would say lately, I've been taking on a lot of nonfiction trade history. And I'm looking for those super fascinating stories that illuminate a, a piece of history I thought I knew and illuminate it in a, in a whole new way to make me understand it in a completely different sense. And yeah, so that's really appealing. That is the kind of thing I just will latch on to immediately. And a, a novel can do that too, you know, help me understand a different world perspective through some amazing character who's unlike any character I've encountered before. That applies to any any, any genre. So 
yeah, on the most immediate sense, that's what I'm looking for and what I could potentially fall in love with within just a few pages. I love that. I love the clear, concise, and understands what it is. That's great. The next question is, Do are there agents for poetry books? Agents? No, there's not. <laughs> Agents um, really don't represent poetry. Of course, there are a few exceptions to that. But the reality is poets are mostly publishing with smaller houses. Again, a reflection of the market. Not that many people buy poetry books, unfortunately. And so it does not usually make sense for an agent to be involved with a poetry book, sadly. We represent one poet. Okay, interesting. So on that same note, the next question is, I'm wondering about the need slash desire for an agent for pitching to small, smaller presses. So um, agents are often not completely necessary um, or just not necessary for small presses. Most small presses are willing to work with an agent, <laughs> more or less. There are a few really small ones who just don't want to work with us because we'll make things difficult. But... <laughs> But because they and they and it may just simply be because they don't have the means to pay more money or negotiate the contract, and I don't blame them for that. That's fine. But yeah, it can kind of it can kind of go either way. I do sell to some like smaller presses. You know, I'll, I'll I've sold to like Grey Wolf, all these places. But even those are kind of like big presses within the small press world. So the question an agent will always kind of ask is, can I add value? to this situation or this deal. And if I can't add value in some way, I can't get you more money or negotiate, you know, the the contract or make it a better, you know, situation for you, then it doesn't make sense for me to be involved and take that 15%. So, that's kind of where that that question lies. But yeah, with the big publishers, you absolutely do need one. Okay. Well, all the other questions we had, and we had lots of questions for you, we have answered already. So I just have one last question. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to find you out in the world? So I am on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is just Elise Capron, all one word. I'm also on Facebook, Elise Capron one and Instagram, but I would say Twitter is kind of where I'll do most of the actual book um, related stuff. So that's the best place to find me. You can also go to our agency website, which is dykstraagency.com. It's D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A agency.com. And there you can actually also see bios for all of our agents and you can read exactly what kind of projects each agent takes on, what some of the titles they've represented are, and just really find out a lot of that good basic information and find out our submission requirements too. I love that agents tell you on their website exactly what they want from you. That is a major tip. Go to the website after you find them, however you find them, and read exactly what they tell you to give them and give them that <laughs> in a, what did you say, clear, concise, and a way that understands what it is. <laughs> yes. I love that. And if any of you listening would like some more help on this, I do have a program called Path to Published, which includes two other interviews with Elise as well to help you write a query letter and do a lot of the agent stuff. So I just am so grateful for Elise coming on here and coming onto my programs and just being my friend in general and answering all of my questions, whether ridiculous or wonderful, around the publishing process throughout all of these years. Well, I'm just so, so happy to be here and really honored that I've been able to be a little tiny piece of your exciting journey and all the amazing stuff you're doing. So thank you so much. It's a real honor. Thank you so much for coming on. And everybody, all of those links that Elise just said will be in your show notes. So don't worry, you got those links. And I hope that you all follow Elise because she shares some really great information. Thank you again, Elise. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Today's book recommendation is Britt Bennett's The Mothers. This isn't really a book that I normally would have picked up. I don't really, I don't really read a lot of books about motherhood and about the way in which motherhood changes us, about the way in which pregnancy changes us. So I, I kind of think I would have sloughed it off, but it's actually not about motherhood at all. It's about childhood. It's about growing up. It's about 
teenage life. It's about growing old. It's about the difference between serious love and long-term love and love that lasts. It's about community. It's about church. It's about the way in which we can oftentimes judge others, um, especially religiously, especially around churches, and not really look within ourselves for that judgment. It's about the little moments that change everything. And it's set in San Diego, which I live in San Diego, and there's rarely books set here. So that made me really happy. Uh, I just, it was just beautifully written. And I, even though the stories of the youth were different life than mine, they felt so resonant. They really connected me back to this part of my childhood, of my teenage years, where people were exploring what it meant to leave school and go off on our own, what it meant to start having sex, what it meant to start falling in love, and what it meant to be a part of a community and then not, and then try to return to that community. So really beautiful book. I highly suggest it. And the cover is just amazing. So it's fun to have on your bookshelf. It, once again, it's called The Mothers by Britt Bennett. And we'll have links for you to buy it down in the show notes. Oh, and side note, I listened to this one on audiobook and loved the narration. So if you are a fan of audiobooks like me, check it out on Libro FM. I highly suggest it. You just finished another lesson at Business School for Writers. Feels pretty great, right? Being one step closer to a thriving writing career. I am so excited to see how you put to use the tips you learned today. So please share what you gained from this episode in the Writer Squad Facebook group. You can find your squad at facebook.com slash groups slash writer squad. Want even more support making your writing dreams come true? Go to businessschoolforwriters.com where not only can you find show notes and links from today's episode, but you'll also be able to explore courses, coaching, and free resources we've gathered together to help you along your path to creating a thriving writing career. Thanks again for listening to the Business School for Writers podcast. I'll see you in the next lesson. Business School for Writers is hosted and produced by Lauren Murray Fleming with editing and support from Samantha Olivares. All rights reserved by Las Maestras LLC. Our music is De Lejos by Ila Bamba. Check them out on Spotify. Big thanks to the team at Terrorbird and to Kristen Hozak. And of course, big thanks to you, the listener. Now put down this podcast already and go write. I'll see you next episode.